like there are only three groups. Only three groups have submitted their work. Uh, uh, and this is a bit of a concern because I have the work for group number seven. I have the work for group one, which is A. Group A, seven is what? I think that is group. There's a group that submitted the work and it is called seven. And yet our work is in, it is in what? In alphabetical, A, B, C, D, not numeracy, one, two, three. So seven is what? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then I have G. I don't know. The group for Stella Sanya is group G. Group seven, I'm yet to, I didn't note down. I need to know this is which group alphabetically I'll confirm. Then Hello. I have group A. Yes? Hello? Hello? Doctor. Yes, Jimmy? Uh, my, I, be, I belong to group number G stroke seven. But two groups have submitted now with that one. You are uh, you are Jimmy, isn't it? Yes, together with me are uh, you must have Francis Ochami, Jenna Shubwe, Charles Manyara, Sylvia Shorn, and Brian Campbell. Now that is group seven, isn't it? Yes, or G. No, Stella Sanya, which is your group? We are groups. C. Oh, it is C, not G. Okay. Maybe that is the confusion. Yeah. It is C. So I have A, C, and G. Three groups. Excuse me, Dr. Yes, Brenda. Yes. Group H, we submitted via your email because the portal had a problem and Dr. Munyao was not able to rectify it in time. So we decided to send it via your email and I, I, I did a subject on the same. Oh yeah, that group is group H. group H. H. Another group through email apart from Brenda's? Group five, group five, group five as well. Group, as well. group, two. group two as well. Our group as well, we sent via email, Dr. That is which one? Should be group, group F. 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 So I have group. Can, can we use the? Can we be using the alphabet so that we can be, we can be systematic and uniform? So we have group B, which is two. Group E, which is five. Then F and H. I'm missing one group. Which group is missing? Which is group number D? Group number D? Group number D, are you here? This is the group of Henry, Juliana Magomede, you are here? Yes, I'm here. We also submitted on email. Group D. Yes. Anyway, as I make confirmation, I want just to have three groups which are going to be a representation of the narrative inquiry. Actually, the narrative inquiry was meant to be, we were meant to do it in a in a seminar manner, because it is meant to be more experiential, more practical, after understanding the theory behind it, the understanding behind it, so that it becomes one. Hello, Malimu. Yes, Mku. Yeah, before, uh, let me interrupt you. I wanted to confirm that Group H, we shared our work via your email, your Gmail, not the Desta email. That one, actually, I saw that one through the Gmail. There's work I saw through the Gmail. Yeah. 
but I must confess I have not opened it. That's why I couldn't talk about it. So that is the one. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I'm saying that the narrative inquiry is really meant to be an approach that we are able to internalize and make it more experiential, more practical in understanding the change process. And when you look at the narrative inquiry, after you went through it, you realize it is more the element of storytelling, more narrative, so that ultimately there is a connectivity of even a serious research aspect with our social settings through the storytelling. And if you can go back before we can have a few, some few presentations, you go back to the context of African education, you are able to realize that it was more of the storytelling. It was more of the spoken word, especially before the invention or the coming of the written word in our context. And therefore, when it comes to understanding the drivers of changes in a social system, the drivers of changes in our societal perspective, then you realize that still those drivers of change would be embraced and understood from a narrative perspective. So the narrative inquiry, and I hope you are able to enjoy it because it makes you go back. I don't know what is our average age here. And if you are relatively young, you can still look at it, not in terms of maybe if you didn't enjoy the virginity in court of our African setting, of our dances, of our storytelling, in passing information, in understanding the changes in our own ways of doing things, then you must have experienced the oral literature, the storytelling sessions from a school setup, which is quite choreographed against the Western or towards the Western world, but all the same, an, an aspect that makes us understand where we've come from and who we are, and something that is so original that we can borrow from it in this highly technological 21st century time. And we can even borrow it in our own institutional settings, in our own organizations, and that the narrative inquiry approach also can be a good means of understanding the various changes. You know, sometimes those forms of uh, maybe like in a school setup, staff room narratives, those stories of teachers are able to influence a small action change in a school setup. Those sharing of experiences in conferences by various stakeholders without necessarily going through the rigors of what it means to understand change. People are able to share and say, we discussed this in a form of storytelling is also able to inform some aspect of change in a broader educational perspective. And maybe for our ease of understanding this narrative inquiry, I want to invite group number eight, group number eight to share with us what they came up with as far as the narrative inquiry is concerned. Are we having group number eight here? Yes, the group members are there. Oh, it is the one of Boaz. It's chaired by Wekesa. Not really. No, no. Group number eight is group H. Group number H is group number eight. That is yes. the group of Muku, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Sam Nyambera. 
Caroline Gule, Brenda Otieno, are those the members of group number H? Yes, you're right, Dr. Yes. Boas, is that your group? Uh, no, sorry about that. Yeah, that is not your group. I can't see your name. In fact, group number eight has four people. I hope it has additional people now. Okay, so is the group ready to do a sharing of the narrative inquiry? And please take a maximum of five to seven minutes so that we can have at least half of us, then we deliberate, then I introduce the topic of the day today. That was my choice of the group, but is there a group that is feeling as this one is wondering what to do? Is there a group that is ready to present? Any group that is ready yeah, to we present? Are wondering. We, we are just trying to, to see how we can be able to share. <laughs> we are okay, Dr. Okay, 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 Brenda. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know if we do, do we need to share our document or or we can just present it without having to share. No. You can do yeah you can present it so that we can see what you have. Okay. Okay so uh we were doing a reflection on the narrative inquiry method and uh, our group members are Muku, Sam Nyabere Judy Maina, myself Brenda, Faith Nzuki, and Molin Anyango. So you aren't going to share, you are just going to make that presentation. Uh, okay, just give me a minute. Okay. Yes, just a minute. So we are going after group number eight, the other group that should be prepared is group Brenda, group Brenda can I help you in sharing the screen? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I'm sharing. Can you see my the document? Yes. Yes, Mualim. Yes, we can. Just uh, yeah, that's that's okay. Let me rotate the screen. Yes, please. There you go. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, sorry for taking a bit of some minutes in the sharing. But uh, so our group did a reflection on Maggie, Savin, and Lava, Van Niek, uh, esteemed researchers who are known for their contributions to narrative inquiry, which is a qualitative research method centered around understanding experiences through storytelling. So their work delves uh, into the complexities of narrative inquiry exploring its application in various fields. For instance, education, social sciences, and higher learning. Through their research and publications, they have highlighted the significance of using narratives in uh, uncovering deeper insights into human experiences and the complexities of interpreting and presenting stories within qualitative research frameworks. Savin and Van uh, Niek's work emphasizes the nouns aspect of narrative inquiry, shedding light on its strengths, challenges, and potential applications in understanding uh, lived experiences. So that, that was our introduction. So um, in Jim Barry's narrative, a slight, disappoint, a slight disappointment arises when a character confesses visiting a nursery window, not to see someone, but to listen to stories. This story serves as an entry point for an exploration of narrative inquiry in this particular article. 
Narrative inquiry focuses on using stories uh, such as data, aims to comprehend lived experiences through research and literature. Drawing inspiration from Peter Pan's engagement with stories, the article aligns with an anti-narrative stance, emphasizing hesitancy in, and incoherence. The narrative inquiry approach is placed within a constructivist framework, emphasizing reflexivity, sorry, interpretivism, and representation. The article explores debates about qualitative methods in geography, highlighting the tension between precision and a more expansive view. Differences in perspectives and representation highlight broader disagreements among qualitative researchers influenced by views on the nature of truth. The article also challenges the assumptions about capturing reality through narratives, advocating for an understanding that recognizes the dynamic nature of language and speech in creating experience. Various scholars' perspectives, including Denzin and Paul Kinghorn, are discussed contributing to the ongoing discourse in qualit qualitative research methodologies. This paper emphasizes the significance of narrative inquiry as a research method, challenging the notion that stories merely serve as shared experiences. The authors, Drawing from their teaching experiences in occupational therapy and higher education, stress the need to differentiate between stories as data and the broader scope of narrative inquiry. The discussion delves into competing trends in narrative inquiry, acting Ponking Horn's distinction between narrative analysis and paradig paradigmatic type analysis. The paper also highlights the variability in what constitutes a story across methodological fields, referencing the bio, bio, uh, biographical interpretative methods development in German sociology. The incorporation of open-ended questions, the elicitation of memorable stories, and the avoidance of why questions are presented as principles in the biographical interpretive method. The authors reflect on the ch challenges of defining what qualifies a story, illustrating the nuanced nature of narrative inquiry in their research projects. In essence, the paper calls for a deeper understanding of narrative inquiry beyond mere storytelling, emphasizing the complexity and diversity inherent in interpreting and utilizing stories as a research method. Consequently, the sixth paragraph of this article discusses narrative inquiry and its complexities in understanding stories. It emphasizes the importance of the researcher's role in eliciting and analyzing stories while highlighting various sources like field notes, interviews, and autobiographical writings. It stresses the need to listen to participant stories, acknowledges the mutual construction of the research relationship, and the dual nature of people both living and telling their stories. Furthermore, it addresses the multifaceted nature of storytelling. It use, its use in validating truths or promoting particular professional ideals and its role in shaping identities. The seventh paragraph delves into the essence of storytelling within research, emphasizing the role, sorry, emphasizing uh, the role of the narrator in making the story relevant to both themselves and the listener. It discusses the narrative structure, challenging the idea that narratives must follow a structured plot, highlighting how life interruptions, like unexpected illness, illnesses, can alter uh, the trajectory of a story. It provides an example of a disrupted life story and how work became cr a crucial part of reshaping the individual's identity. Additionally, it emphasizes that narrative inquiry focuses on uh, understanding participants through their stories, suggesting that stories are closer to real life events than other research methods. The process involves constructing and interpreting stories between the narrator and the researcher, later reenacted at a different level in published research. Analysis in narrative inquiry often involves examining epiphanies and metaphors within the stories. The text delves into the concept of epiphany, initially tied to the manifestation of Christ's divinity 
and later expanded by James Joyce in literary context. It, in, it explores various types of epiphanies <coughs> proposed by Denzin in interpretive uh, research, categorizing them as cumulative, illuminative, major, and relieved, all seen as transformational events in people's lives. Additionally, it touches on the significance of exploring epiphanies as vital components of individual storied lives. The text suggests that narrative inquiry analyzing not just stories, uh, not just stories, but also figurative language like metony and metaphor. Metonymy, the substitution of a name with an attribute, is seen as a way to understand participants' perceptions influenced uh, by class and culture. However, it highlights a challenge, the use of metonymy and metaphor in a second language may lose its original experiential meaning. Metaphor, though sometimes considered outdated, remains a powerful tool in qualitative data analysis, offering symbolic meanings to data. It helps uncover implicit assumptions as seen when a researcher referred to a university as a sausage factory, reflecting a bias against lecture-based education. The text, in essence, stresses the importance of examining epiphanies and figurative language in narrative inquiry, revealing deeper layers of meaning and biases that influence both researchers and participants. The text discussion, this, uh, the text discusses the strengths, challenges, and dilemmas associated with narrative inquiry. It highlights the benefits of participants sharing themselves openly through stories, facilitating deeper reflections and revealing truths uh, without much concealment. However, it acknowledges some uh, uh, several cons and dilemmas. Among the cons, that, uh, yes? Uh, do you think you can get some help? Uh, yes, please go ahead, Sam. No, no, I would, I would let you continue so that uh, when you feel ready to get help, then you can call me. Okay, all right, thank you. So among the cons that we found as a group were, uh, interpretation challenges, whereby the difficulty arises in, in interpreting the relationship between storytelling during interviews and the subsequent presentation of data. Secondly, op ownership and interpretation, determining whose story it is and how it should be interpreted becomes complex, especially if participants disagree with the presentation or wish to include sensitive data. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also found that complexity in data interpretation, which is the text emphasizes the uh, complexity in deciding the relationship between the initial narrative, its interpretation, and the retold story. Consequently, uh, uh, continual challenges in data presentation, the negotiation and presentation of data interpretation pose ongoing difficulties. So I'll, I'll request some uh, to pick it up from there from the dilemmas as a, a winds up thank you yeah thanks thank you uh, brenda for for that good reading uh, but i want to think that uh, we are not expected to read uh, our, our presentation uh, word uh, by word so i i'm not likely to to continue reading but i, I would want to just uh, quickly mention a few things here yeah, as, as we read uh, on the dilemmas, I mean, the challenges that uh, face this uh, narrative inquiry method, uh, we are told here that uh, <clears throat> the understanding concepts like credibility and validity that are usually crucial for research rigor requires honesty in narrative inquiry. But you see now, ordinarily, when you are told a story, uh, if you hear it from the originator of that story, that story can be very valid and credible. But if you hear the story from a third or fourth person and considering the elements of distortion, uh, chances are you will even doubt the credibility of such a story. And therefore, uh, it, it leaves the researcher wondering whether uh, this method is reliable as a research method. And we see that uh, despite these challenges, the text also provides practical examples of how narrative inquiry has been used in higher education, uh, such as exploring student experiences in South Africa and problem-based learning in the UK. 
So clearly, uh, despite all these challenges, the narrative uh, inquiry method still continues to be used and, and it's proven to be effective. And uh, Mku, if you can uh, scroll up a little, yeah. So overall, uh, the text emphasizes both the strengths and complexity, complexities in inherent in narrative inquiry, acknowledging its potential for deep insights while navigating challenges related to interpretation, ownership, and data presentation. So this uh, research method here is, is presented to us. And, and, on, and of course, it, it actually uh, brings about lots of discussion around uh, the areas, uh, especially when you think about the dilemmas that come with the, the narrative inquiry. However, uh, it still has stood the, the test of time. It's still in use today. And I think uh, it's still going to continue being used. And especially when you think about uh, uh, our day-to-day -day work as teachers, because students actually enjoy storytelling. And, and, and many times, uh, especially when you're thinking about uh, sensitive areas, you would learn so much from students when you let them tell their story. Because at the end of the day, a child may not actually know how much they are revealing when they tell you their story. But as a professional, as an adult, you are able to pick bits and pieces of how best to help this child, depending, of course, on what kind of story they were telling you. So uh, I think, I'm not sure whether there is uh, another member of our group who wants to say something. If there is, please just come on. I'm not sure whether we still have time though. Anyone, Malimu, do you want to say something? Malimu, cool. Yeah, I can uh, can summarize. Yeah, on thank what... you, sir. Or not the text was emphasizing that the overall overall the text emphasizes the transformative nature of uh, problem based learning for educators and touches upon the untapped potential of narrative inquiry in educational research demons demonstrating the need for more in-depth qualitative methods to capture the richness of experiences and context in the in academia Yeah. So Malimu, you have summarized, right? Yeah. So I think uh, we we can donate any additional time uh, available to the next group. So Dr. Susan, back to okay. you. <laughs> you have not donated any time, but you have, yes. Uh, I will request that we just keep our um, concerns or any uh, issue you may want to raise so that we can have the next two presentations, then we can respond. We can respond to any issue. You can specifically draw your um, suggestion or your question to a particular group. So I, I would prefer that we complete because it is the same task. If it, there were different tasks, we would make the presentation, then we engage. But because it is the same, I would wish to have two more. And I believe after we have the next two, we can all have the open session unless there's an issue that a particular group will feel there's need for them to make a presentation. When I go through your work, then I will be able to make the various remarks. But I want to believe that once we have the next two groups making their presentation, then we can engage in with the areas that we feel we need understanding. Uh, you, you realize this one even became a little bit easier because of the article that we went through, because that article actually brings out the, like the characteristics, what are the pros, what are the cons? How do we employ the narrative inquiry? To what extent do we feel we are having it? And you realize, I like the way Mku just summarized it very fast in terms of talking about the transformative. Remember, we are in a very transformative season and a very transitional one, especially in our Kenyan context. It is so transformative, 
it is so transitional. It is passing people until people who are in the education sector are wondering, I, this is where we are, because it is moving very fast. And the complexity, you are able to note that the complexity of the narrative inquiry, it being part of the PBL problem-based learning, then we are able to have an open mind in understanding what is this narrative inquiry? How are we employing it in our various organizations? And more so, to what extent do you feel that this narrative inquiry is actually an influencer in our educational transition. Can I have the next group number A? Can I have group one? Then we shall go to group five, which is group number five is G. Okay, you are making me think alphabetically and the hands are up. Do you think what? Talk or we finish, then we can we can talk. Please let's have the presentation, then we can express our views. Florence Mathieu, is that okay? Yes, Malimu, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Group number one, or that is normally a biased group. One and last <laughs> is very good. Uh, Dr. good evening. Good evening, Chris. Yes, I'm in group one together with both Sarah, Elizabeth, Vivian, and Stephen. Okay. I unfortunately I want to excuse myself because I'm in a match. Uh, I want to request if any of my group members perhaps is seated somewhere comfortably to present or rather share the document for presentation kindly. Thank you. Who is in a comfortable place, according to Ekesa? He misses he's not in a very good environment to do sharing. Uh, I'm in a mat and I'm logged in with my phone. Okay, it is well. Members of group number one? Um, Malimu, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, just a second. Chris, Wekesa, Boas, Waroko, Elizabeth, Kiambo, Vivian, Kemadi, Stephen, Ochami, and Sarah Ange Angachi. Is Sarah Angachi here? Can we hear the voice of Sarah? Sarah, you can do. Boas, you can project. Sarah can do the presentation. Is that okay, Sarah Angachi? It's okay. Okay. So Sarah is presenting. Boas, can you present? Or oh, Sarah, you can make the presentation. You can project, sorry. No, let Boas do it. Is Boas? Projecting or is he making the presentation as well? Mm. Let him project. Okay. Thank you. Boaz, back to you. Boas, you can hear? Yes, I can hear, Malimu. I'm just trying to attempt a share screen. Okay. Oh. Sorry about that. I think uh, I had lots of materials open, so... Boy, it should be it should be able to to go now. Just a second. Um, huh.
Okay. Sorry, Malimo, I'm unable to share. I'm sorry. Who is able to share from your group? Can you find out? Sarah, can you share? That is group number one. Yeah, let another group come first. As we index one. Can I have index five? Can I have index five? Group sour, number sour. E. Yes, Sorry. we are here, Dr. Juliet Otieno. Yeah, uh, so Tasleen will take up first. So Tasleen, are you able to share the screen? Tasleen. Is Tasleen here, Lily? I can't see. Yes, her. yes, she's here. Okay. I'm here. I'm trying to share. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay. I'm seeing a okay. start now. It's loading. Is my screen visible? No. In your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um oh my god. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't know. I it's it's not sharing. I don't know what's what's the problem. Yeah, it is sharing now. I think this is mine, Juliet. Okay. Oh, that okay. Yeah, yeah, that's mine. So Tasleen, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh huh. Maybe just go down a bit, Juliet. Yeah. Huh? Just scroll down. I think I think oh, there's something I've not Juliet. And yes. you started uh, let me stop then. I think this is my screen so that oh, you can continue. Is, if it's yours, okay. just use yours then. You it's, don't have to oh. move it and use someone else or what oh, okay. you. Yeah, we can um, just okay. use it. Yeah. So maybe I'll start and then Juliet will follow up later. Um, mm -hmm. to cover an in depth, uh, uh, to cover the questions in depth, we have split the work into three parts. Our reflection on the article, how we find the narrative inquiry applicable to the workplace, and finally demonstration of its effectiveness in our individual work our workplace. So our in our reflection. Uh, in, the, in the article, Narrative Inquiry uh, on Theory and Practice by Maggie and Savin Baden and uh, Lana Van, that one, uh, provides an overview of the narrative inquiry as a research method and the, the theories relating to it. The authors, the authors also look into the position of the narrative inquiry in qualitative research me methodology, that is, what it is to be considered a narrative ways of analyzing narrative data and uh, finishes by offering practice, practical examples on the application of this method in educational set up, setup and also at workplace. Uh, the author makes five arguments. The first one uh, is that narrative inquiry transcends biography, autobiography, life stories, and, and life course research. Uh -huh. And then the next one, narrative inquiry is positioned within the constructivist paradigm. I remember the paradigms that you had studied before. And then the third one, narrative inquiry must go beyond the notion of just telling stories and uh, it looks for, uh, into other things. A narrative Narratives do not necessarily have a plot or structured storyline, but, but are inter interpretations of um, reflections in a story life. And finally, that's, the focus that's on uh, yeah, you are moving like a jet. Oh, I'm going so, so fast. Yes. I'm trying to sit in the five minutes and then I speak with us. Let me go a bit slower. The focus of, of analysis is the, is the people who tell us stories about their lives. The stories being, uh, being the means of understanding our participants is better. So in our reflection, we focus on uh, arguments 
one and two and uh, four and we left uh, arguments three and five to provide an as a supportive premise for uh, the other arguments. In the first argument, the other in the first argument, the authors the authors uh, place narrative inquiry above above traditional approaches of gathering dates on people's experiences. They argue against the notion of casualty, consistency, and linearity that seem to be the main assumption of these methods. And then on the second argument, uh, we found that the author had a point in putting narrative inquiry in the constructivist theory, uh, theoretical framework as constructivists insist that reality is a social construct. They answered our question on the applicable approaches when they added with reflexivity, interpretivist and uh, representation being primary features of approach. However, we still found that narrative inquiry when applied at workplace as a means of promoting or discouraging behavior. Please move down. Cindy. Mm, you've lost me, okay. There, no, you, you've gone past. Yeah, there, 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 there. There. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. No, don't go so. Okay, so. However, we still found out that the narrative inquiry, when applied at workplace, as a means of promoting or discouraging behavior, uh, sometimes does not work to help the listener create their own reality, but guides them in a pre-constructed reality by the narrator. Besides. The audience still have the possibility to create their own reality from the presented narrative. Even in our quest to understand people better as, a, as posited in argument five, the meaning we create will depend to some degree on the factors that Cindy. Factors other than the story itself such as the level of knowledge of the context in our interest of the narrator and personal biases. In the fourth argument, the author argue that narratives do not follow a structured plot, but are interpretations of reflection on a storied lifestyle. They, they, explained, this, uh, they explained this using a theory of the, of the life of a lady who sickness inter who sickness interrupted her life plans, assumably uh, the plot. It seemed, therefore, that the plot of that the plot of narratives changes as experiences change, and our perspective of uh, our sp perspective of our past uh, experiences change as well. We found this to be true, especially when dealing with narratives covering long periods of a person's life. However, when the method focuses on an issue that happened in a continuous framework, such as experience of a student in one lesson, there is expected to be a little or no interruptions in the story unless a, disrupt a disruptive occurrence happened in between the beginning and the end of the class. Yet, still, even the disruption becomes part of the plot. So we therefore felt that in such a case, while the story might not follow the pre-planned plot, the interruptions are part of the actual structure of um, our final story. Nonetheless, we still agreed with the assertion that most narratives are complex and non-linear. In conclusion, in the article, the author makes an excellent point in defining narrative inquiry as a qualitative research methodology that involves studying experiences as stories or creating stories from experiences. We agree that the method can disclose exclusive perspective and profound understanding of a situation. We also concur that data management, how and how the stories are inter inter interpreted might offer a challenge to those who all employ the method. Also, it suffers biasness as people tend to dwell on their lived experiences and how situa 
eh my situations affected them rather than what causes the problems uh faced it is also time consuming especially when the story covers a long span of a person's or group experiences nonetheless since narrative inquiry goes beyond just telling and recording stories, we found it it is useful uh, in several occasions at workplace and such as dispute resolution and chain management. Uh, Juliet can take over. Thank you, Molimu. Thank you, Taslin. So, uh, Cindy, you can just scroll up a bit. No, is it up or down? Down, please, so that that B can go up. So we are we are going to see how narrative inquiry applies. No, down, down, Kitogo. Yes, thank you. How narrative inquiry applies at the workplace. So uh, I think in the up there when we were uh, giving out our article, we mentioned that uh, most of us here are in the education sector. So most of our um, examples will be coming from a, a, a learning institution setup. So narrative inquiry has various applications in the workplace. First of all, it makes it possible to comprehend the experiences and viewpoints of the staff members on a deeper level. Through focus groups, interviews, or written narratives, employers can learn about the subjective aspects of work life by encouraging people to share their tales. This can assist in locating trends, obstacles, and achievements that traditional quantitative measurements can miss. For instance, a class, uh, uh, for instance, class teachers are better placed to provide a detailed account of individual learners as they have first-hand knowledge of the behavior of the students in their class through through own observations, what students report, as well as what the stories subject teachers share. So that was the first instance, based on the class teachers' report about a learner, because uh, they know them better, most of like maybe have uh, most of the time with them, they are in a better position to tell much about a learner if there is some information that is needed. And again, narrative inquiries are also a useful tool for change management and organizational growth. When an organization is going through change, the employer might want to know how the changes are impacting the employees. New employees are uh, and bosses will also find narrative inquiry as vital in understanding the culture of the institution. Additionally, it is a great way to engage employees to find out about their motivation and what they might need to change. I think when the, Dr. Susan was explaining, as uh, we were maybe before the group started to present, uh, she mentioned something like a Maybe like in a school setup, like the teachers in a staff room when they are seated there and they are talking and one of them maybe sharing their experiences. Yes, it could be a story that is being told, but there are some information we are picking from there that one may help me, maybe as a new member who is not familiar with the information, to see what can I apply in order to bring a change. And sometimes even when you are explaining maybe the past things you've done and how maybe you have managed to move from one state to another in terms of performance or even handling your class. Uh, the point that you've given there in, in case of leadership, maybe the person who is just trying to listen from you, you could be the boss, you could be just uh, one of the people there gathering data. There is something they may learn, and that is how you may end up uh, being in a better position to take up their responsibility. So it can also be used during conflict resolution when there is conflict, it is important to let both sides air their views and find a common ground. It provides a platform where everyone's voice matters and their stories are put into consideration since they are given an opportunity to tell their stories which help in solving existing problems within, within the institution. In this case, uh, the inquirer asks uh, leading questions which open up a platform for discussions and people are able to respond to the questions from a personal perspective. And then on organizational growth, organizations can employ narrative inquiry to help it pinpoint areas for development, possible conflicts and areas of strength by gathering and evaluating tales. This strategy is especially helpful in creating an inclusive and transparent culture within the company since it provides different experiences and voice. A safe space is enhanced when members of staff voice their dissatisfaction without fear of intimidation or dire consequences. For example, 
where harassment of a junior employee by a senior management officer is a habitual occurrence, the administration needs to use this instrument to support its statement and take the necessary uh, measures. I think uh, with the illustrations we are giving there, uh, we can understand them. We really don't need to uh, explain further. So demonstration of the effectiveness of narrative inquiry at our workplace. Four of the five group members belong to the education, sorry. Okay, and number one is understanding, learning, truancy. Educa uh, educators use narrative inquiry to help in solving personal and ac uh, academic related problems, truancy being one of them. Through telling stories, an educator is able to understand a student's psychological status, emotional state, the challenges the learners go through, and probably identify their courses with an aim of providing a workable solution to the problems. For example, young learners will explain their reason for not coming to school on certain days by telling stories of abusive parents and them having to seek asylum at the neighbor's place. Some tell stories of their sick parents or siblings and, and how the learner has to stay home to care for the siblings, cattle or business. These have in numerous occasions, not only provided an understanding of their reason for the absenteeism, but also offered invaluable insights on the help and support the learner might need and the avenues through which the school can help. Secondly, understanding changes in learner performance. Educators constantly have to deal with learners who suddenly begin to fail exams, chronic, chronic latecomers, low self-esteem, and even unkemptness. We found that there are several untold stories behind these symptoms. For example, students from war zone communities are likely to get low grades due to their past experiences. That is according to Francis 2018. Also, a learner with special needs may not learn effectively due to their conditions and the challenges they go through in school and at home. We shared several instances where teachers have asked questions that elicited stories to get to the bottom of the causes of poor performance in academics and other areas of life of school life. Learners have told stories of being treated unfairly at home, being bullied on their way to school, and even uh, strain in their parents' relationship. Students whose performance have become better have also opened up on their courses by telling stories such as the graduation they attended and how it impacted them. Go up, Cindy. Uh, the stories others who have gone uh, to better schools shared and in some cases the admirable lifestyles of their visiting cousins who studies in uh, at an international university. Then there is change management. The group member who works at an NGO shared about how a new CEO was able to successfully transform the culture and performance of the organization through narrative inquiry. The CEO took time to meet with the departmental heads individually to ask them their experience with the company. He then spoke with the floor operators about their experiences and dreams. From data collected, the new boss managed to create an environment where all felt they belonged. Some departmental heads were restrained, new departments were created, and the welfare of the workers improved. It was by listening to the workers' experience that the new head managed to create a reality that matched up to the meanings they desired to create through this, their stories. Then in conclusion, when properly employed, narrative inquiry is a powerful tool at the workplace. And these demonstrations are just a glimpse of, the, of its effectiveness. Neither are they normative. As noted in our reflections, data management is a primary concern when employing narrative inquiry. To get any good out of it, the researcher needs to focus on the narrator and how, and how they, the narrator, wishes to be understood through the stories they tell. If this is not done, the educator may consider the learner whose parents are sick to be too preoccupied to be a good student, or the worker who complains of poor scheduling of health breaks to be too lazy to help achieve the company's goals. Yet, without downplaying its weaknesses, we find that this method proves itself useful in almost every social setup as people love to be understood and explore life through stories. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you so much, this group. Uh, first, uh, your references. Now, 1990, now, 1986. Do you know 90 is that 34 years ago? And knowledge changes, narrative inquiry. So those references must become recent. Let us not quote any material that is 15 years and more. So let us be within the 10 years at most 15. Thank you. I, I first want to say that this group has responded. This group has actually responded to the way I framed the tasks. That is my first response to this group. Can I hear group one? Then we wind up unless there's a burning question, then we are going to talk more about the narrative. If need be. Doctor. Yes. I, I, I'm just thinking if we are unable to share, could you please allow Sarah to read it out? Then the members can react on that. No, we are supposed to become taking us away. We are 21st century. <laughs> we, okay. are, we are 21st. We understand, yeah. we understand the challenges. All the same, I think you can sort. I want group number C. Put your work pending. Group number C, the one of Stella Sanya. There's something I want to see in their work. Can I have it? Who is sharing? Hey, okay. Finally, it is, uh, is up. Yeah, finally, better. Oh, finally, thank you. <laughs> okay. I hope the person who is going to talk is not going to read for us because we can read. At least let the person say, just get the catch ones, the topic for issue, give some explanation and move on. I want to see an understanding of what you are presenting. I, I am not, let us um, not read one for one. Thank you. Malimu, let me, let me start off our group. Uh, and I think uh, the colleagues would be able to follow. Mm. And uh, our group, of course, uh, it is important to indicate who are the members there. Uh, we had Vivian, we had Christopher, uh, Sarah, uh, Stephen, um, Elizabeth, and myself, Boaz. And uh, of course, it is a reflection on the narrative inquiry and showing how the, this applies at the workplace. Of course, with the demonstration on the effectiveness of narrative inquiry at our workplaces. So uh, from the work and the conversations we had, we started by reflecting on what narrative inquiry is and its application. And indeed, uh, we went straight to the article by Maggie Savin Baden and Lena uh, Van uh, Nikek. And we did indicate that uh, when doing this uh, uh, narrative uh, inquiry, the, it's a compelling approach. And indeed, it enables one then to understand the human experiences. So our reflection is actually to help uh, in the exploring the relevance and potential effectiveness of the narrative inquiry in a workplace context context, uh, drawing it actually on the principles discussed in the article that we read earlier. So first, our understanding of the essence of uh, narrative inquiry. And we say that at the workplace, uh, we know and uh, we've seen how individuals do share stories uh, to communicate actually their experiences, challenges, and uh, successes. That we say that uh, narrative inquiry in itself, it encourages us uh, to listen to such stories. And as such, uh, it also helps uh, in the reconstruction and uh, research relationships, particularly recognizing uh, both the storyteller, whom we considered in this case, 
be the employee and then the listener or the researcher or the manager whoever wants to use this in the interaction the application <laughs> We had uh, a number of uh, areas of the application and we started with the employee experience and reflection. And uh, here we even mentioned the aspects where you can use open-ended questions and the employees can then share their experiences. Uh, we also say that uh, this can help foster deep understanding of individual experiences and it helps to contribute to the engagement of the employee because then they also derive uh, satisfaction when they do engage. The second uh, uh, part of the application in the workplace on, was on the organizational change and transition. And in this case, um, you're saying that uh, it is important that uh, whenever an organization uh, going through change, uh, such narrative inquiries become very powerful and is very helpful in enabling uh, all the actors to understand uh, uh, how even the leaders uh, operate and then how communication is done, is tailored, and then the, any concerns that uh, are arising from the process or the way they work uh, can also be dealt with. The aspect of professional development and learning. We said that, uh, that this narrative inquiry in this case will help in aligning uh, the professional development initiatives. And of course, in this case, you know, that uh, from uh, such narrative inquiries, one would be able to gather all the elements, including the successes and the failures, and which are the key moments in that area. And that is very helpful in uh, planning for uh, professional development and the continuing to learn from that. Uh, the team dynamics and then the collaboration, uh, a narrative inquiry just in itself, you know, it brings people because the conversation brings the people at the workplace together. And within this, uh, there's a team building, uh, the bonding, and you are able to deal with all the dynamics that there are. And uh, of course, we also looked at then <coughs> the challenges and then the limitations. Uh, we categorize this uh, numerously. I don't know whether there's a colleague of mine who'd like to pick up from there or uh, just going to the first one, the subjectivity and interpretation, the confidentiality and the ethical handling, the subjectivity. Uh, uh, next, which was also done with the yeah, the subjectivity and the interpretation. Is there a colleague of mine who'd like to go through the challenges and limitations? That's what I'm asking. Okay, sir. Yeah. Sorry. Or Sarah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you may, unless you want me to continue. Continue, boys. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so on the challenge. On the challenges and the limitations, we say the subjectivity and interpretation. Uh, we said, you know, when storytelling, of course, it's subjective. And uh, this is based on a person's experiences. And of course, uh, somebody's story, you cannot tell them how true uh, that story is, or you cannot tell them of that it is not a true story. So it is based on their own perception. So there, there's bound to be uh, the dynamics there, the issues of how do you then uh, interpret it? Uh, how do you take it? Uh, how is it uh, useful in the workplace in that kind of a manner? Can you rely on it and such uh, kind of details? And on the confidentiality and ethical handling. Of course, uh, when sharing personal stories, you know the exposure this has uh, to the in the workplace because uh, one may just be over, uh, overwhelmed and uh, maybe having told in detail some personal stories and experiences and all that. Mm -hmm. And if there's no protocol on how that can be handled, uh, it also has the negative element of exposure uh, to even privacy issues, which were not, uh, uh, which, which were not necessarily considered earlier on. There's also the uh, 
complexity in the data interpretation and uh, presentation. And here, in terms of assembling and interpreting interpretation of the data and all that, these are different stories. Varied people have come, and indeed, uh, it becomes uh, not very easy to create a harmonious now storyline uh, with various inputs that you have uh, collected. And then the data volume and also the time, time consumption. Uh, obviously, uh, when you take this approach, you'll realize that there's a lot of data, there's a lot of material, and then how you even try to start coding these stories and how you make it then become uh, coherent so that you tell a story which one can learn from. Uh, the reliance on the subject's memory uh, this puts to on the, uh, the spot the accuracy and depth of stories in the narrative inquiry. And of course, as I mentioned that you see, this is best and subjective. It's based on somebody's memory, it's based on their perception. So that becomes very limiting. And so in conclusion, we did uh, realize that narrative inquiry actually is a valuable framework for understanding and leveraging the power of stories in the workplace by recognizing the significance of individual narratives organizations can actually promote a culture of openness learning and collaboration and we say that applying this at the workplace enriches the understanding of the employee experiences and it contributes more uh, to informed decision making fostering a positive organizational culture and of course ownership by the employees thank you Okay. Did you present the last section? No, that was all. Did I see the demonstration at our workplaces, boss? The last section. So that is what I've I've walked through on the on the in the summary form. Uh, when we are saying uh, the demonstration at the workplaces, I think. Uh, Particularly when uh, I think we, we, we inbuilt it by indicating when uh, you are doing so at the workplaces in terms of uh, say uh, uh, having a change moments and you're bringing the, the, the work or the workers or the employees together to put in or to give in their stories. I think those are parts that I mentioned. Uh, uh, my colleagues, if, if okay. there's a part no, which no. I've not, because I've just done a summary of it, Maldimo, uh, because uh, I wasn't okay, really okay. <laughs> prepared to yeah. be presenting it, but it's okay. Thank you. Can I have a very brief presentation from the group of Stella? Stella Sanya, that is group C. Can we end up with that one? Yes, Silvanus is presenting for us. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Oh, okay. This is group C. And in group C, we are four of us. There is Othello, Sanya, Stella. There is Getare Silvanus with me. And then there is Osanya Milton. Uh, we discussed in depth. And uh, we only highlighted in this document the key points and uh, the real summary. So our introduction was a bit uh, voluminous because we felt that uh, there is much more in the narrative inquiry, whereby we really mainly based on one real life example that I'll be giving later on. Uh, and then we say narrative inquiry is a qualitative research method that normally uh, involves the exploration and analysis of stories or narratives to understand the experiences and percep perceptives of individuals. So normally we say that in a workplace, there are different people, especially when you are in a diverse workplace, uh, there are diverse people in terms of culture, race, in terms of even tribe, in terms of even the personalities. 
we have those people who normally heal their problems or pour out their depression by just giving stories or talking things out. So in this case, narrative inquiry can be a powerful tool for uncovering the complexities of organizational dynamics. So we can use those stories to have this uh, dynamics in terms of complexities in an organization, the experience of employee employees, and the broader context in which work unfolds. So as we reflected on this, that is on the application of narrative inquiry at our workplace, uh, we can see how it has been effective in promoting understanding, fostering communication, and even driving a positive change. So from there, we say that uh, from uh, the, the narrative inquiry, we can have a positive change in an institution. So on notable aspects, narrative inquiry is the ability to capture the richness and the depth of individual's experience. In a professional setting, this translates to gaining insights into the diverse perspectives and background of employees. So bringing different uh, backgrounds together and getting to know all that. By encouraging team members to share their stories, narrative inquiry allows us to appreciate the unique journey that have been shaped by their professional identities and attitudes towards work. For example, for us, maybe those who are teachers and young teachers who are starting the profession, when you sit down and listen to a person who has been there for a very long time, you are able to develop yourself professionally. So this understanding foster empathy and builds a more inclusive workplace culture where individuals feel seen and valued. So at our workplace, uh, we implemented my workplace. I think I'm the one who gave this example. We implemented narrative inquiry as part of project aimed at improving employee engagement and satisfaction. Through individual interviews and group storytelling session, we gathered narrative about key moments in employees' career challenges they have faced and success they have achieved. Analyzing these narratives reveals patterns and themes that might not be seen apparent from traditional surveys and quantities methods. Then we looked at the effectiveness of narrative inquiry in a workplace. So number one, there is enhanced communication. So through sharing stories, it opens up a channel for communication between team members and even the management. In this case, the employees will feel more comfortable expressing their thoughts and concerns in a narrative format, leading to more open and honest conversation. And in this case, this is very important because it leads to, uh, it contributes to healthier and more transparent work environment, which is very important in terms of bringing up positive change in an institution, for example. Number two, identifying organizational patterns. In this case, through uh, analysis of narratives, we are able to identify the recurring themes and patterns within the organization. Uh, this includes the, uh, the challenges that employees face, uh, an aspect of the workplace culture, and uh, the impact that it brings with it. So this enables the target intervention to address specific issues and even improves the overall satisfaction. Then we have facilitating change. The stories that employees share, they become powerful uh, advocacy tool for change. The narratives provide concrete example of areas that need improvement and severe catalyst for organizational change initiatives. Uh, Othello gave us an example since now that he is um, one of the, uh, do I say the, how do I put it? One of the first students of DU. So he gave this example where he said that in a, cup, a couple of years ago, Desta University hired an organization to assess the university's operations and recommended areas where improvement was needed. 
As a result, the staff and the faculty were interviewed during that process. Following a submission of the report, the university authorities moved quickly to make significant investment leading to improved facilities in terms of the learning and teaching equipment. Specifically, he talked about the library in DU, which I really want to visit one day and see how it is. He talked about it. these people who came are the ones who inspired the construction of that library due to the stories they were sharing and uh, what they was they were talking as they were as they were um, interviewing the workers and everyone in the university. Next, we have building a sense of community whereby when we have uh, members of the same community sharing stories, uh, being open to each other, it contributes to building a sense of community within that organization. So by acknowledging and celebrating the diverse stories and experience of these employees, we have fostered a strong sense of belonging and cohesion. This has positively impacted team moral and collaboration. So we concluded there and said that uh, the narrative inquiry has proven to be an effective methodology for understanding the human dimensions of the workplace. By valuing and exploring the narrative of individuals, we have gained valuable insights that have informed strategy decision, improved communication, uh, yeah, so this is really very important. If you go to some institutions, they normally have sessions whereby members of that institution, maybe they, in a school, the teaching and non-teaching staff come together just to share stories. For example, where I work, I, I give an example here, where I work, we have story time. Story time is normally on Wednesdays after lunch for 30 minutes, story time for teachers, for students, you just share a story about yourself or, or a story about where you work, a story about your office, just to improve uh, how the HR is able to manage the human resource management. So this is very, very important. Then lastly, we looked at how narrative inquiry applies at workplace. Maybe any member of my group who could like to present or I just finished. Maybe, okay, this is Othello. Uh, just to add to what you are saying, there, uh, I'll, you, you can finish, but I just want to say that the, the environment needs openness so that when people share their story, it is kept, it's like a family. When, when you work as a family, and you, you can be free to share your story because the, your story is not going to be used for anything, for any victimization. You just explain and you tell people what you feel. And the kind of situation that we went through at Daystar, uh, it was in that way that those the, 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 the administrators they sent these people to us to interview, or they were not there. So we were giving them some of the problems that people were facing, lecturers were facing in teaching, and maybe lack of equipment, such kind of things there. And the students, the equipment they, need, they needed to use at that particular time, which were not available to the students. I mean, if the equipment was available but not sufficient enough for students, for all students to get their hands on them. So we impressed upon the, these people that we need to invest. If we are going to make progress, we need to invest in those things. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this next one is just a, a, a more explanation on the same, whereby we are saying that participants that are involved in a narrative inquiry normally enjoy the process and often see themselves as the core inquirers and core collaborators in the study in which they are involved. So this also enhances the social interaction model of change and it includes interaction among us various stakeholders through the storytelling. Then we have effectiveness of narrative inquiry this practice is used widely to get the pulse of organization and performance being service industry, hearing from customers. We serve as well as the team that directly serves customers. It is very critical in maintaining unmatched customer experience and keep up with ever, the ever-changing times and competition. 
So the data-driven decision-making through this model has helped to keep many organizations at the top of the industry. So we have quarterly sessions with customers, that is from the book, the customer story day, like in my school where we have the weekly storytelling times, where we get to hear the experiences on our services and products, how we can improve and how we should maintain. So the employees also have internal forum where they give feedback to the leadership team on what is working and what is not. Yeah, this was basically the summary of what we understood from what we were reading. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari. Thank you. Maybe I want we, to, yes? If we have any additional or any in any addition contribution remark any point anybody who had put their hand up now it's time to share and say just make comments but i i just want to you are able to note that narrative inquiry is a method in research, in qualitative research. I know you are going through the research methods and I know you are getting from the best, Professor Ailo. And you are now in understanding the narrative inquiry from the research perspective, then you realize that stories tool tell a story which can pass the test of time. Now, I know there's controversy about the subjectivity of the narrative inquiry. There is also the perception that a story keeps changing from one source to the other. By the time the story moves from me to Taslin to Cindy, by the time it reaches where Ruth Ngose is, it is a totally, if it was a story about the hyena, and the leopard, by the time it reaches Ruth, it will be about the cow and the antelope. So that has been um, a debate. But one great success story about the narrative inquiry is the realization that it is able to bring a change from a real, from the reality you know, from the practical. It is able to, it's very real. It attaches on the individual. It attaches on the person. And when you read, for example, a number of research papers, even when they are so quantitative, we are told that numbers never lie. But when there is the voice, the voice, also has much more weight, like the number. And the voice is captured. That voice capture is actually narrative. I was happy to note that this group talked about the social interaction model. We spoke about it as a model where we are encouraging. It talks about the interactiveness, the interactiveness in the social system. How much can we say? I, I got excited when I heard that there's a school where they have a storytelling session where people are told, go and tell your stories. And you can imagine the power. If now I would open this floor and say, can we tell our stories? We always hear people say that everybody has a story. But the $1 million question is, are the stories ever told? Do we ever give people time to tell their story? What is your story? What is the story within your family setup? And I said from the beginning of this course that we look at the change, we look at the conceptualization from a personal perspective. That is when we broaden it to beyond a person. Do we tell our stories? To what extent 
do the stories that we tell direct where we are going and what we are doing? To what extent do we also ensure that the story that is told to us is actually a story that is going to change the trajectory of a student's life? Do we give them time to share their stories? As a staff, you go there when you are a new person, then you are told this is not who we are. We are defined, our culture, and I'm just about to introduce that now in another perspective, in understanding change. You can imagine if we would open up, even in our own family setup, in our own family setup, tell our children, tell your story. If they can't speak it out because they are at that stage of mm, mommy never listens, daddy never listens, tell them to write down. You will be shocked what they are going to write. You will be shocked what they write. Just making them say something. You know, I, I, I love teaching Sunday school. I love teaching preteens. And in my church, and maybe some of you will relate with it, we have what we call the, the camp of the young people when they are transitioning to high school. They are taken out for about a week. And the parents are normally told to write a letter and just tell their son or their daughter something, just tell them something. It's very interesting that a number of times some parents never have something to say. And they ask, what do you want me to tell him? What do you want me to tell her? You are a, Just tell them a story. Tell them anything about is your son, is your daughter. Just tell them something. And let me tell you, it takes three weeks for a parent to say something. You know, that is narrative. Just say something. So because they are told, we are living with a letter which is sealed. You must write the letter. And so they have to sit and write the letter. Of course, the letter is kept then. It is given to the, to the young people almost the last day. Then they are told, we have a surprise for you. Surprise, surprise. What is the surprise? There's a letter from who? From mommy, from daddy, from a guardian. And those young people never believe. They start saying, no, this letter is not from my father. Why? He has never told me the things he's telling me here. I don't know if he's the one. They cry. These young people, they are just pretend. They shed tears. Why? It means that there is something. There's a story from within them. They would wish to share out with a parent or a guardian. And they are not able to share because the person to be shared to also has no story. Most of the time, stories are two-way, like any other form of communication. I'm, I'm sharing this to just as a wake-up call. As a wake-up call. Do we give the young people time to share? Do we share our stories to our children? And that is why now the stories they are shared are the stories of technology, just this social media, very destructive. Anyway, can, can I open this session for a short time? Any question? I think there's so much we can talk about narrative and quietly, but one thing is good is that it is actually um, an approved scientific method of research. It is approved, it is scientific, it can pass the test of a set, is that research? An understanding of narrative and quality, it is experiential, very collaborative, very open, very personalized, and at metric, it is able to make us be who we are by speaking out. And of course, we can reduce our mental, we can improve our mental health, by the way, by sharing stories. I think it is a, a prescription to one's mental health. If you share your story, you don't need to see a doctor. You will be halfway cured. So can we embrace narrative stories for our own personal stability, 
for our families growth and even for the organizations where we work for that way we become the change that is needed thank you odelo florence machio we start with you any other person whose hand was up uh, Malimo, before I share, maybe I will ask, will you allow the other groups to, at some point, uh, to share, or uh, uh, this is it, before I say what I'm about to say? Your answer will determine when I say what I'm about to say. I, maybe we can agree, because I thought because it was the same task, unless there's a group that feels, we can take this one as a consensus. Unless there's a group that feels there is something they feel, they need to capture. This last group did not mention the article that I gave out. So I have a concern. That is why I actually picked on that group because I didn't see them mention the article. So I want us to get to a consensus. Do we listen to the remaining three, four? Or do we, unless there's one that is that you feel we need to listen to? What would you say, Manyara? Malimo, can I answer to the same question? I only wanted yes, to just share an example of uh, demonstrating uh, narrative inquiry in the in the in the workplace. Um, an, an angle that I don't see has been captured. That's all I wanted to share. Mm, so even if we're not going to share again, it's fine. Uh, it doesn't have to. Apart from, I just, Florence, apart from that, and is there something else you feel has not been captured and you'd want to bring it out as part of this or somebody else can? We can also look at it from that angle. Uh, from my perspective, it's just that angle I wanted to share, the, the a different perspective of application of narrative inquiry in a different setup. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Manyara? Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, in a school setting as a teacher, the narrative inquiry, sometimes it, it, it really helps us to get a deep understanding to our students, particularly the current generation who are not uh, easy to express themselves to you. Ask them anything, they just tell you, hakuna kitu, na sijui, two, two times which they are so used. But sometimes when you are able to give them a better opportunity, just tell them, just, just speak. They will find that uh, they'll be able to give you a story and you will get the inner person. So at least it's a good thing. And I'm, I'm also appreciating it now at this master's level is that... Uh, is one way of appreciating the African culture of storytelling, as you stated. So at least you can see it is a... I don't know if it's just me, but you're not audible, Mwalimu. I'm I don't not know audible. If... Yeah, but now you are. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't want to share much. I just wanted to uh, share some... I watched some... Uh, some TED talk by Chimamanda Ngozi on uh, uh, power of storytelling. And she was saying that storytelling is so important that as much as, as it, uh, uh, it might be biased and anything, but it helps us in healing. It, people listen more when you tell a story than just coming there to teach. When you start with a story, you just um, arrest people's attention and they are able to listen to you even all the way to the end. So yes, yeah, that's, what I just wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You are actually in agreement with Ruth in Gose who says it is therapeutic. Yes, I had a question. I had a question on references. The other okay. day when we were talking to a profile and we asked about the timelines, he told us that he, he actually wanted 
wanted us to go as far as even 1900 in our research and in our citations but today you're also telling us that you can only like you can only um approve 10 years and below so what's what the real what's what's the most recommended timeline for uh, citations thank you i uh, i feel citations shouldn't you know professor Iro is a research guru I know there are those which have the what we call what is it the philosophical writings, but any research paper I know should not even go to twenty years. Twenty years is seen as um quite very many years, so I go for ten to fifteen. I want to finalize with just a statement from Paul, a statement from Modelo. Then we hear the sharing of from Florence. We close this session. Is that okay? Okay, Dr. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I will just want to concur with my colleagues that uh, uh, narrative or storytelling uh, is a is a is a very rich in uh, information dissemination and collection of information. And uh, to add on that, I wanted to give an example of teachers like in schools, uh, lower primary schools. Uh, I know so, most of them, when they want to learn about uh, uh, some students or pupils, their family set up, what they're engaging in uh, when they're at home. Uh, they normally ask them to write a composition, maybe write a composition for, uh, about uh, your family. And you find these students, uh, they will say everything about their parents, their family setup, how they live, whatever they're engaged in. Uh, and at the end of the day, you find uh, uh, when you go to school, uh, maybe at some point, all the, the teachers really understand what kind of a parent you are. <laughs> So they uh, I also wanted to add something. Uh, oh, I think Saslina uh, talked about it. That uh, storytelling uh, really uh, provokes attentiveness uh, in uh, to those who are the audience, and it's also recreational. Uh, it, it helps in. Uh, making people spend their time well uh, in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Odelo, you have a statement to say? Yes, thank you, Malimu. Uh, I just want to say that you were talking about we can have a session on storytelling. I'm telling you, if you open a session on storytelling, we shall go for the class for maybe a, a two or three days. People have stories. But one of the things I want to tell my colleagues and all attending our session this night, this evening is that storytelling is one of the most powerful tools, especially in teaching. And Manyara was talking about this guy, the generation we are dealing with, you ask them to comment on something, they just keep quiet. One of the things I use is this thing of uh, 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 narrative inquiry, uh, telling them story. I provoke them and then they now debate. I bring up an issue and it, it brings a very, very tough debate especially when it pits the, the, the young ladies against the young men. It becomes another big issue in class, and then I have to intervene when they are doing that. They get provoked when you bring up an issue, uh, especially storytelling. And having worked in the media for many years, I have so many stories. So I bring up story, especially when it put the girls against the, <coughs> the boys to debate this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Florence, if nobody has touched on that earlier, please you can bring it up as we close the session. Florence, Matthew. Just, just before Florence, uh, mm -hmm. I had forgotten something. Uh, I, I wanted to say also that uh, uh, a narrative uh, is, is also used in investigation, especially when security agents are looking for information about a particular uh, thing in a certain place. They go there listening to stories. Like you go to those border borders in their stages, we might we, we sometimes security agents are always there to listen to what is going on around that place. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Florence? Thank you, Malimu. Um, I think just additional from, you know, appreciating all the groups and how they've shared. Uh, part of the assignment was to demonstrate the effectiveness of the narrative inquiry at the workplace. And so that's what I want um, I want to share uh, briefly. Thank you. Florence, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, Malimo, I was just opening it up so I don't miss out anything. So, yes, so demonstrating the effectiveness of the narrative inquiry at your workplace. This was done as part of uh, group two or B assignment. Uh, the, the team members, so that they know that this is part of their work, is uh, Doliana, myself, Leah, Maureen, Meshak, Paul, Rhoda, and Teresa. So, I give an example because of where I work and what how narrative inquiry uh, has been effective in shifting a few things in terms of policy and even a budgetary allocation. Um, I, for the benefit of this class, I work in the office of the president, uh, advising on matters women's rights and child protection, uh, serving under the uh, women's rights advisor. So that's the background. So the Kenya government has made commitments both globally and regionally and nationally on matters women's rights and, and child protection. And in this demo, in this narrative, in this, uh, we will demonstrate in this story how the narrative inquiry is effective in identifying gaps within uh, policy implementation and also achieving women's rights. The case study will focus on matters women and children. So Kenya has always prided its, uh, itself with progressive laws and policies, uh, but the challenge has always been the implementation of the same. So as an advisory arm of the government on matters women's rights, we find the narrative inquiry useful in our advisories as we capture the lived experience of women and girls. And therefore through their stories, we capture implementation gaps that might exist in different contexts. We do agree that women and children are not homogeneous. With every county, you find different things. So we visited a county and, um, and we met in a room filled with about 25 children, the youngest of them being three years old and the oldest being 12. All these children had been defiled and some were carrying babies. So you can imagine that picture. So in another room, we met 10 grandmothers aged between 65 and 85 who had been raped. All of them were widows. So that's the context of this narrative inquiry and its application. So when through hearing their stories, we were able to write a report uh, to the president that speaks to uh, data collection of matters regarding gender-based violence. Currently, if you look at the Kenya Demographic and Health Survey, it focuses on age groups of 15 to 49 when collecting data. And therefore information for under 15s in matters, rape, deferment is never captured, nor is the data for the age group above 50. So that means these grandmothers we met and these children that we met are not showing up in the data. So in the advisory, we also noted that in some incidents, chiefs were creating kangaroo courts at the village where goats exchange hands and therefore justice is never served. So these are conversations you'll never find in court unless you use narrative inquiry. We know that in government without data, one cannot make a case for structural changes or budgetary allocations. We also know that if we have the Sexual Offenses Act and the Children's Act that speak to the violations that I've stated in this story, uh, the stories behind the data will help convince even the most difficult of patriarchs in the room to do the right thing. So the laws themselves will, are not enough. The data itself is not enough unless we apply narrative in, inquiry. So we've used the narrative inquiry and we've managed to make a case for the training of chiefs as well as pushing for a dedicated trained crimes unit within the police to handle these matters. 
The stories shared have helped us to see the gaps that, that gaps still exist. And for us to have a proper monitoring and evaluation of policies and laws, we need to continually listen to the lived experiences of the end beneficiaries of the said policies. So the delay of sexual and gender-based violence cases through the justice system has made many survivors to refuse to take their cases to court because of the long duration of such cases. Now applying the narrative inquiry within the justice system by listening to the court users committee, the judiciary has been able to establish 14 special SGBV courts to fast track these cases within the corridors of justice. Listening to the children, listening to the grandmothers helped us engage with the judiciary with the narratives that spoke into the gaps and directed us to solutions that we might not have come up with if we had not applied the narrative inquiry in our work. So the judiciary now has developed an SGBV strategy to support survivors who interact with the justice system to offer legal support for them. Because through the narrative inquiry, we were able to identify that people sometimes are not able to go to court because they are intimidated by the court system. So giving support, a strategy on giving support to survivors ensures justice in the end. So all these have happened because of the narrative inquiry application at the workplace. Uh, that's what I wanted uh, to share so that we see a real life um, application of narrative in inquiry. So our travels in different counties, listening to women and children also helps us see the different cultural contexts and also speaks to the fact that women are not homogeneous. I had said that before. So without applying the narrative inquiry, based on this experience, then the voices behind the data might not be heard, nor would the numbers in the data make a connection with duty bearers. Thank you, Mwalimu, for the opportunity to share that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florence. You know, you have just made my mind move into, you know, like today I was in this conference, there's an international conference on violence against children at Desta town campus. I was actually one of the facilitators, uh, one of the moderators and tomorrow I'm making a presentation of a paper. And one of the key things which came out was still something to do with the narrative inquiry. And I was even telling somebody that is a topic that I've been handling in a class that I'm teaching. And I, I love the passion with which Florence will bring it out. You are a gender consultant, or you said you are a gender activist, isn't it? I am. I, am, I, I work in the Office of the Women's Rights Advisor. My background is women's rights and child protection. I'm very passionate about that work. That is my calling. I can actually <laughs> hear from your voice the passion about these narratives. And let me tell you the evil which is out there against children is just nerve wrecking. When you listen to the stories of children, and there are several children who are there, who are participants in that conference. I wonder why you are not there, Florence. You have such rich information and you are realizing that you can actually write a whole paper on narrative inquiry. Not yes. just a whole paper. You can actually write a whole dissertation, a whole thesis on narrative inquiry because it's a very rich method of collecting data, especially to those unspoken, those subtle things which are hidden under the bed, covered with the sand. Nobody wants to speak about it. My presentation tomorrow is actually psychosocial support on male child sexual survivors in our Nairobi County. I have I just realized that the boy child is being abused sexually, very rarely spoken about. So these are the narratives. Very. How can we ensure that this narrative, how the only way the story can change is when the story is heard. You know, we speak about sexual abuse. Most of the time it's against the girl child. Of course, the majority are against the girl child. Actually, one out of four girl child below the age of 15 are sexually abused in one way or another. One out of four. And then one out of six of the boys are also abused. The voice of the boys is not so loud. How can we? So they are so tormented. 
actually the reason I started getting excited, not excited, but interested in the male child abuse is because I know two young boys who have committed suicide because of some form of abuse. And it is not spoken about, not even by the families. Very sad cases. Because of, the stigma, because of the stigma, you feel, okay, if I speak about it, the stigma that goes with it, stigma my foot. Let your story make another child not go through what yours has gone through, even in his absence. Anyway, that is a story for another day. If you are to speak, to give narratives here, Odero said we can stay here up to Christmas Day. So thank you Malika, so much. Can I just say something? Because most, most of my classmates here are teachers. Yeah, and this is my advocacy moment <laughs> to try and help my my classmates also just see it from the perspective of the child. Uh, when we are in school as teachers, when we are in school as tutors, we need to. When that child comes and she or he is smelling, they didn't shower. Before you start complaining that they didn't shower, find out what is going on at home because there could be something else going on. In our school toilets, children are being violated. Uh, violations of children to children, especially boys. Uh, the sodomy that is occurring is occurring in the school toilets. And so for me, I've made sure that as a parent, when I go to a school, I insist on us having CCTV. Why? Because we have to find mechanisms of, of protecting the child. And in one such school, we found a teacher used to pull, it, it was a madrasa, a teacher used to take the kids, the, the, the Muslim kids, and one day we saw on the CCTV, uh, this is later, that he tried to kiss these kids and they came and spoke up. So try and make conversations in school in such a way that children feel safe to tell you what's going on at home and what is going on around them. Otherwise, you might not be able to, to help them. So let's be alert as teachers. We are the custodian of these children when they are with us. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Malimu. She's still on. Maybe she's picking a cup of coffee. Meanwhile, Florence, you can continue spewing. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, I have a question for you. Yes, Brenda. Is it Brenda? Yeah, I'm, I'm really touched because uh, I think our boys are taught not to speak from uh, way, way from childhood. So, in your area of expertise and your experience, how best can we be able to ensure that our boys speak, regardless of the fact that uh, the society has programmed the boy child to be manly in terms of not speaking out and not showing the emotions? How, for instance, as a parent, how do you really try to curb that gap uh, of ensuring that your boy or rather or a teacher in, in a school ensures that boys are free enough to speak up? How can we help this? So Brenda, I am Florence. a mother of two boys. Florence. Yes, Chris. I, I, as you answer the question by Brenda, kindly also try to answer mine. As you talked of uh, advocating for having CCTV in the toilets and so forth. No, no, no. In line so with, not inside. <laughs> not inside. <laughs> or within, or, or even within the corridors within the of the. Compound, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, but if if it's within the school compound, then it's fine. Not because in then the I toilet. Was wondering, is that is that in line with the with the, no, no, with no. the law? No, no, no. <laughs> no of course All not. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So, Brenda, I'm a mother of two boys, and one thing I learned from Anali from the beginning is to ensure that I tell my children, you know how you 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 treat your children about body parts. We always do head issues, Danis and toes, but we never say the other parts of the body. And uh, we are the same parents who tell our children that this is doo doo when there's no doo doo anywhere. There's no na body part called do do and so it begins from there at home so my children knew their body parts from age two and what they are called and the reason i did that is because perpetrators use the lack of knowledge 
for, for that children have to be able to intimidate them and tell them and 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 do things to them that they cannot come and explain. That's why a child will say, Tabi Ambaya. So I equipped my boys in an early age that nobody should be able to touch certain parts of their body. They know that, including me, including their father, without permission. And if somebody attempts, I also give them a strategy of what to do, and I will find out. So from age two, my son knew. And I promise you, I told him at age two, when his other brother came, when he was four, his other brother came in and he was one at that time. And I remember uh, one day, and this is a story I tell all the time, one day I'm downstairs and uh, their father is preparing to shower them. They get to a certain age, their father will showers them. And he, the oldest, I had told him what to do when somebody touches their private part. And so this small one who is one who's walking, has all, they're all undressed. And he went and touched uh, my elder son's penis. And I remember him shouting the way I had told him to do. He screamed and he said, mommy, a mommy is touching my penis. And I screamed going upstairs and I told him, please do not bite him. Because that's what I told him, you bite the arm. And so what that told me is that what I told him at two and I had not repeated was stuck in his mind. And he was able to say it and communicate. And so constant converse conversations with your child will help you notice when something is wrong. And then make the habit of washing your children and make the habit of having a conversation around body parts because there's nothing wrong with that. It's our, bra our brains that make us think that we are sexualizing the children when we are just talking about body parts. This is a particular, just the way this is a hand so that they know this is now private and nobody should touch it, no one. And so once that is inculcated in the child, boy or girl, they're able to speak up very early in life. And you continue having those conversations as they grow, things change and you keep on telling them. And so that's what I've done, a practical example for my house. And I've made my husband who was afraid to talk about these things, he's talking with the boys because now they're 13 and 10. So it's a constant thing that you have to do as children. And where I am in school, I've ensured we have a child therapist who keeps on talking to the kids so that kids are able to open up because the strategies of the pedophile is changing. They are now not, they are now not, uh, they're trying to use, uh, the other case I got the other day was somebody violating the child through the mouth. So inserting his penis in the mouth of a child, boy or girl. And this is sure. because because he knows that it will be difficult when the child goes to hospital, nobody will swab the mouth. So based on that, you have to remind your child, even the mouth is a private place. Nobody should force feed you. Nobody should put things in your mouth. And all these things, because they, the, the devil keeps on coming up with new ideas, you as a parent need to keep on having conversations with your children and reading. Our children are not safe. And so I always say in this office, if, if the most vulnerable who are children are not safe, we are also not safe. Uh, that's very true. And, and I think, uh, I think uh, it's a challenge to, to us, whether you're a teacher or, or a parent or a practitioner in that particular field of U.S. Florence, that at the end of this, I think, course, uh, I mean, there are so many gaps as far as children are concerned, education is concerned. There's so much between the parents, uh, teachers, and, and the students. There's, there's so much left out. Everyone is just wallowing in their own, you know, life and, and people are just living for the mere fact that we're alive. So I think it's also important to challenge us, our teachers to come up with, you know, even some sort of NGOs to be able to sensitize parents and, and relevant stakeholders to come out and speak up and, and you know, just help raise a society of sane minds. I, I'm, I'm just extremely shocked because it's but so Brenda. unfortunate that that's yes. When we are seeing uh, even teachers come in, normally I find it uh, a big contradiction in our society uh -huh. because uh, whenever people want to talk to children about their body parts, about how they can take care of themselves, uh -huh. the church comes with a very big hammer and says it is sex education. 
-huh. And the, 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 this one brings a lot of uh, dilemma and uh -huh. controversy, yeah, because uh, if we are able to bring it and be part of curriculum, uh -huh. what Machu is doing to her children, uh -huh. it is that informal curriculum which we can make it formal and it will uh -huh. help a lot of, of our children. Uh, right now, there's something I'm trying to to discuss with uh, some friends of mine. Because of a particular area in Akuru, whereby primary school teachers, is as if the, the, mm. the, 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 the number of children that uh, in primary, even at grade three, being abused by a teacher. You know, it, 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 you, you really can't understand. Yeah, and the problem is the parents mm -hmm. of these children. The moment the, this thing is discovered, when you want to make the, the people want to make in, uh, uh, further investigation, they connive with these yeah. uh, men. They're given two thousand, three thousand, and things end there. So you, you find that uh, even our society and more so the church should stop this resistance toward uh, making sex education being part of our curriculum. Uh, For Manya, sex. Yes. Manya, it's, it's not just the, the child that has refused, even the government has refused. There's this uh, curriculum uh, that's supposed to be that's supposed to be used in schools called the Comprehensive Sexuality Education that has all this and it is age appropriate like unapata una not whatever is being taught to class three is not what is being taught to class six and it encompasses all this but it has received a lot of um resistance from various stakeholders but once it's it's like used or once it's adopted in schools then then maybe things will change because in the communities you have a lot of um cso's or uh, ngos that are teaching these girls and boys on different aspects and you find that uh we were doing some research maybe last the last two months and you find that uh, uh kids that have gone through this education are more uh, aware of their sexuality and are more aware of these issues than those that are not going through this so then why is uh, the parents or other stakeholders not wanting to adopt this. And uh, when the churches are teaching our children on these things, they usually use uh, harsh words like chastity, I don't know, fornication. And so they they just teach on one thing and they forget that they're also locking out people that are the kids that are already having sex, kids that have been abused already, they lock them out. And that is why maybe uh, we have an issue in that space. Thank you. I think uh, guys, lastly, 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 before you go, uh, Florence. Okay. Yeah, lastly, before you go, now uh, I just came to realize that most NGOs that are child based are run by uh, okay, uh, non teachers. Most of them, non teachers in the in the mere sense that not so many teachers have ever thought about carrying out their expertise outside classroom confinement. So there's, there's, uh, there's, there are some groups of guys who, who are coming up with, with an organization in partnership. They're actually trying to, uh, they've already reached a memorandum stage with Kenyatta University to try and sensitize parents on this, the, the need to embrace CBC, for instance. So they, 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 it's, it's a running program. The organization is already up and running, but then they, you know, they want to partner with Kenyatta University. So I, I was wondering that um, when I checked the profiles of these persons, Okay, some of them are ex-teachers, but it's very rare to find a practicing teacher to think two or three or five of them to think uh, in the line of, why don't we start up something like a, an NGO or a CBO so that we are able, our CBO, one of the, the activities that we are going to partake is sensitize the society against some of these vices. I don't know whether that really makes sense because... Most of these NGOs are run with, yes, people who have um, uh, children at their own, uh, you know, hearts. They, they want to really get engaged in a child. But the person who has a first-hand information and experience to a child is a teacher. They, they, they live with them for close to almost eight hours or nine hours at most, a whole day. So out of 24 hours, a teacher spends so much time with the children. So I think this is a, a wake-up call, maybe, somehow. If you're positive towards it, you can think about setting up something and you just never know. It will really marry so well with with uh, your, your knowledge and, and expertise as a teacher 
and also going overboard and you know trying to help not just within eight to five but outside eight to five uh, working hours yeah that's what i wanted to say brenda there is the beacon teachers movement that all teachers here should join because then they offer training uh, for all teachers in different schools. I've worked with them in different schools. Uh, when we get cases, uh, we alert Beacon teachers in the in the area and we alert TSC. TSC also has a program. Uh, you need to tap into it. Uh, every time there's a violation, the first person to call is a children officer and the TSC uh, person in charge of child protection. So I can link you up with those ones. Uh, there's already a big, huge movement called the Beacon Movement. We're even in a WhatsApp group together that actually go out and do uh, the work of the Lord literally uh, where children are concerned. Um, so the, the movement is already there. Thank you. Over to you, Molimu. Thank you. You can see the issue of sharing narratives, how far it can go until my power went off. That's the power of narrative and quality. Thank you so much. But uh, you, you realize that there is so much that can be done within and outside the classroom. How are we influencing? Do we tell our own? Are we encouraging others to tell? And just as I close this session, um, you, you also need to realize, I, I love the people who brought about the issue of the stories of Tamamwanda, that there's a paradigm shift in terms of the narratives, the sharing, there is the paradigm shift towards technology, moving from the traditional narrative inquiry to somebody mentioned TikTok. TikTok, uh, not the, the shift, not the change. That now most of that which was the oral, anything interesting jumpy when you go to the TikTok. And I, I know there's a lot of debate about TikTok, but I also want you to note that it is very transformative. It depends on which side you want to look at it because anything where there's the good, the bad is there. There's no coin with one side. The coin always has two sides. So there's that paradigm shift, not just only towards TikTok, but there's the issue of the narratives moving towards the technological element, the social media. Why? So that even the younger generation can also now be they can understand because that is their world. How else would they understand the various narratives? How else would they tell their stories? They may not tell their stories the way I may tell mine. What forum can we open? Of course, their world is very big. Their world doesn't have control. Now, it is our responsibility to see how can we create control without behaving in a manner that shows like we want them to come to our world because they cannot come to our world. Unfortunately, we are the ones to move to their world. And that is why there's a big generation gap because we are feeling they should come. Coming where I am for an 18 year old is very retrogressive. It's very retrogressive. And that is that why- is true. <laughs> They can't come. I am the one to go where they are. And that is why you realize there's a big gap. And that's the beauty about this particular course, because it brings the element of dynamism, dynamic towards the future, not dynamic towards the back, because we can't move backwards. We are moving ahead. So making a 14-year-old to think like me is killing their mind to do things like me, to tell their stories the way I tell my stories, to tell them don't touch a mobile phone, they don't understand any other world, they understand the world of mobile phone, they don't understand any other thing, they understand the social media, they only understand TikTok. So it is us to move to their world and see how we can make their world more better, how they can be in a world with decency, how we can create order or how we can enable them to create the order because they too can create that order. 
So when it comes to the changes which we are going through, even at organizational, we cannot have a boss who is 60 years old. And I spoke about it at the beginning. You are leading young people of 20 years old and they think you are away. That is very difficult. It, it, may, it may be progressive, but we have to see how do we also fit into their world if we are going to move to the next level. I think there's a, a lot we can say, but at Metre, we are all in consensus that narrative inquiry is a powerful approach, not just of telling stories, but a powerful approach in the area of research and a powerful approach that is equally scientifically. And I think from the Florence, what Florence has said, we have no doubt that it is one of very rich sources of data that can bring change into various areas which we think we must or we have to look at other maybe quantitative is a rich approach that can bring great transformation in our society. Any question? Now, I needed to make a presentation and I'm almost thinking of doing it in the reverse because I had made a presentation to introduce stakeholders and culture and education change. And you see these ones are actually, the, there is a connection from narrative and quality. Now we are looking at culture and change, education change or organization change. We are looking at stakeholders. Who are stakeholders? Like in an educational setup, what are the roles of the various stakeholders what is the role of education in as an influencer to the cultural perspectives in the society today? And I want, there is the work which is in our, there's work. I want us to go to that work. And then we go to our groups. Now I can't hear myself because there is sudden rain, some heavy downfall where I am. I don't know if it is raining where you are. So we are going to our groups. Then we are going to respond to the activities or the tasks are given on the stakeholders and culture in education. Let's give what do we understand by who are the movers of change? Who are the stakeholders? What is their role in organizational change? Why? What is stakeholders engagement? To what extent does it influence change? And then what is the role of culture? Education in changing the cultural perspectives. I think we will go and do that assignment in our groups right away. Then I will be the first one to make my presentation next week. Then we will get into the presentation. Am I communicating? Repeat. Malimu, you are fading. So at some point, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I think there is some downfall. Kunanyesha uku kwetu and it is affecting. Malimu, could you text us on the on WhatsApp? The question. But the, the work is on the e-learning. The work is on oh, okay. the e-learning. Okay. Is that okay? Can we go to our groups? I'm trying to see where. Dr. Ayuya, are you here? Or is it Dr. Monyao? I'm here, but I wanted you to, do you want to clarify that assignment uh, just for them uh, so that they don't have to ask many questions on the group? What is in the e-learning? 
I'm not so sure if Munyao posted, Dr. Munyao personally, I didn't. No, but, I am uh, the one who posted. I'm the one who posted in the e-learning. Which week? Today. Uh, it is just show, It is just showing the assignment, Dr. but it's not uh, showing whether it's a group work or an individual work. It's just about the topic there. On the stakeholders Dr. and culture. Yes, week six. Dr. Yes. Dr. We don't know whether it is group work. Or we didn't know whether it was group or uh, individual work. But we can see. I have shared it on the on the WhatsApp group. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so That's Prof, do you want do you want to guide a little and? Uh... Also, yeah, that is uh, that uh, is the class activity for groups. I wanted us to do it as a group. I had thought that we do it in pairs, but I thought in pairs it becomes easier to share as a group. I see rich sharing of experiences when we are in our groups. That is why I would still prefer that this work is done in groups. Let it be a complete paper of at least 4,000 ones because it is quite broad. And I think this one, we can start having the layout of our work today, then we can submit by next week. I actually gave it one week for submission. Oh, four four thousand words will come to about eight pages or so. Yeah. Uh, do you really? When are they expected to submit the assignment? Next week. Um, uh, I'm just wondering whether you might want to add them some more little time. Um, with four thousand words being in groups and uh, the diversity of the groups, and then probably might you want to guide on, uh, um, the 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 way you would like it presented. Is it in? PowerPoint? Is it in Word? Do you want to give it some grade? I don't know. This will take the form of a term paper, point number one. So it will be font 12, spacing 1.5. Of course, all that, the layout, as you have been taught in how to present a term paper, I think for now, you don't have to put it in the PowerPoint, just write the term paper and post the term paper on the e-learning portal before, at least by next week on Wednesday. Or do I add you a week? The time is also moving very fast. Malimo, please add us because we have other That's work that is pending. What yeah. about supposing I give you next week on Wednesday to complete this work because I think I will even be on Mombasa that Wednesday night. Will it do any better so that by the end of the work on Wednesday, then you submit the work? Well, it, it's too soon for us because we also have other needs. So please just give us another week. Well, so that, that, that is one week only. Okay. If you can give us two weeks, it can be better because we have got other assignments pending. Okay, then I can make the extension of the submission for two weeks. Actually, Thank other you. assignments, including term paper that you already gave us. The term paper is going up to December. <laughs> so, so Prof, do you want, to, do you want it to be another term, second term paper, this one, or is another one? No, this one, the term paper is individual. This one is group. So I want to be part of the way I'm awarding their marks. So this is still to be graded. The term paper is individual. The one to be submitted by 22nd of December is individual work. This is group work, but it is going to be graded, just like the other one which I have graded. I think that is clear, isn't it? Yes, Dr. you understand. Yes? Yes, so Malimo, the deadline is on the 6th of December for this one. Yeah, the 6th of December, so you can get into your groups and you start the layout of your work now. 
Thank you. And also, Molly, Doctor, do you want to clarify? I've heard you indicate that uh, next week you also want them to extend this time to finish this uh, uh, term paper. So you actually say you won't be in class next week, but they will be into their groups finishing this work. Is that what I heard also? Yes, yes. I'm suggesting that next week on Wednesday, they sit in their groups to do this work. Okay. Are we together? Yes, Malim. Uh, uh, that one, that one will have given you ample time to do and complete the work. I want to believe so. Do we start today? Well, then can I also ask, um, one person will present will present this work for, for on behalf of the group, this, those groups that are, they are, are they going to, they're going to do this work in the groups that are already formed by you. So one yes. person, okay, all right. And I think I spoke about that last week. Let the work be presented by one person. Please don't present the same work to people. So you have to choose the person who will be submitting the work. That is clear. Excuse me, Dakari. Yes. Yes. You mean you mean the the person who will do the submission of the work is the same person who will do the presentation? No, not necessarily. Oh, okay. Not necessarily, no, no, no. No, she's saying we, the one person from the group to submit so that we are not several people submitting the same work, just yeah. one person from the group. Yeah, no. Then we have that one okay? person presenting, yes. Yes, it is, Dr. Ari. So we can move to our groups now and we start having the plan and the understanding of the task for the next 30 minutes, one hour. Is that okay? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay, Doc, I will mm. be ending the class as they go in their groups. I'll end the, sorry, the, the recording as they go in their groups and uh, I wish them well as I'll, I'll stop recording. Uh, and I, I think I, they will not be coming in the main session. They will, as they, they are free to leave anytime they are done, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, that is true, yeah. Okay. And, and I believe now you can go to your groups just to 